Good morning, everyone. Today we're here with Miss C. Cole Dillon. Now, many of you who have went to college have acquired loans, and a lot of you are in debt. And Miss C. Cole Dillon is going to help explain to you the process of getting loans if you're in the process of having a child possibly graduating uh, high school or you got a child just entered college. So, this would be good information for you. Uh, but, Miss C. Cole Dillon, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So explain to us about the process of getting student loans and what people don't really realize about it. Okay, so there are a couple of things that you have to realize. The first is that the process of getting student loans begins with the FAFSA, and it's the Federal uh, Aid for uh, Students document. And every student who gets financial aid has to fill out one of those forms. So that's where it starts. And there are strategies to filling out that form. And the other thing is that once you fill out that form, there's no consistent way of interpreting it. So the feds put out one way of how you interpret that document. And then um, colleges have other ways of how they might interpret the FAFSA form. The FAFSA form is important because what it does is it says, how much money a family can afford to contribute to a college education. So let's just kind of walk that back and see how it plays out. If, for instance, the college that your child chooses to go to includes your house as an asset in terms of deciding what you can afford to pay, if you have a nice house, but that's not cash, they might include the value of your house as an asset that can be used to pay for college, but it's not cash to pay for college. So they may give you a much bigger bill than you have cash to pay. Then what my, most parents wind up doing is when they have a gap between what they're being told that they should contribute for their child's education and what they can actually afford to pay, they fill that gap with student loans. So in the world of student loans, there are two kinds of student loans, and it's really important to know what they are and to distinguish between the two. So the most common form of student loans is what they call a federally guaranteed student loan. That loan is issued by the Department of Education, and that loan is guaranteed by the American taxpayers. What that guarantee means is that if you fail to make your student loan payment, the um, government will be made whole by the taxpayers. Okay? And what you give up in exchange for that guarantee is a promise that for as long as you live, you're going to pay on that student loan. So I want everybody to hear me clearly. Student loans includes a promise that for as long as you live, you will pay on that student loan debt until you have paid it off. And the way that they enforce that is by not allowing you to go to the bankruptcy court to be able to discharge that debt if you feel like you're upside down. So it also means that when you retire, retirement is no defense to paying back your student loan. And um, the fastest growing group of student loan borrowers who are being garnished are Social Security recipients. So it never goes away. So it's important to make sure that you understand what you're getting when you take these loans out. And it's, more, it's very important for you to understand that there's no way to get rid of the debt other than paying it. That's 92% of all outstanding student loan debt has a federal guarantee and outstanding student loan debt is estimated to be $1.4 trillion. And that means that the other 8% is private student loan debt. Now, private student loan debt is different from federal student loan debt because it does not have a guarantee. And that means that the taxpayers are not going to pay in the event that you don't pay. And the way that the company that issued the loan gets their money back is that they sue you. And when they sue you, they will get a judgment. And the judgment is attachable to any asset that you have other than your retirement account. So that means that you can be forced to sell your home. 
that your bank accounts can be attached, that if you have any stocks and bonds, they can be attached. So a private student loan is far more deadly than a federal student loan, which only guarantees that for the rest of your life any wages or payments that you get from the government can be attached. So make sure that you know the difference and make sure that you understand that when you take out a student loan to pay for school, the system is set up that you're going to pay back that loan one way or the other. There is no out. There is no bankruptcy court. So the majority of the people have the federal student loans, correct? That's correct. So you're saying that they can garnish your wages. And I know people have told me that they are taking income tax from you and everything. That's exactly right. So any government payment that you can get um, can be intercepted. Um, what happens when you default on your student loan is that you are put on an intercept list. And that means that any governmental organization, that's city government, county government, state government, federal government, if they owe you money, that money can be intercepted to pay toward your student loan debt and will be intercepted to pay toward your student loan debt. Um, it also means that if you hold a state issued professional license and that can be um, to practice law or some other trade, your license can be interrupted if you fail to pay back your student loan debt. Now, um, I don't want anybody to hear these things and be horrified and say, I'm not going to take out any student loan debt. It is to tell you that if you do take out student loan debt, have a plan for how you're going to pay it back so that these awful consequences don't come to you because not getting an education can't be worse than paying back for it unless you pay too much. Right. And you see people like doctors, you know, lawyers, et cetera, that have a lot of student loan debt or even just some people with bachelor's degrees come out with, with a lot of student loan debt. So you, you suggest that when people get out of college and get that job is that they uh, appropriate a lot of those funds if they can afford to, uh, to hurry enough and paying those debts off. So I'm going to tell you a couple of things. One is that there is a college for every budget. It's like buying a car, right? When you have Chevy money, you don't go shop in the Mercedes dealership. But we kind of don't pay attention to those rules when it comes to college. So um, it's we sort of think if it's more expensive, it's better, and you should get the best college that money can buy. And that's sort of a mistake because it kind of means that you're overpaying. So let me give you an example of how I would encourage you to think about that. If you were going to be a school teacher, um, you, you generally have two or three options in terms of types of colleges that you could go to. So I'll give you an example based on colleges in, in Chicago. You could go to Chicago State University, which is a state university. If you're from Illinois, you pay in-state tuition. And if you graduate on time, your college degree is going to cost you about $120,000, assuming that you live on campus. Now, you can go to um, a different kind of school, like a private, not-for-profit school, like maybe Loyola or DePaul, and get that same degree. And it's going to cost you about $160,000. Or you could go to a top of the line college like maybe Northwestern or the University of Chicago, and that degree is going to cost you around $250,000. But if you plan on being a starting teacher when you're done, the number one employer in this area of teachers is Chicago Public Schools. The Chicago Public Schools pay all starting teachers, no matter where they got their degree, about $38,000 a year. So if you went to Chicago State and paid about $120,000 and got your college degree, um, you did great for yourself, even if you had to borrow for it, because the likelihood that you're going to be able to pay it back is great. And if you use your federal grant money, um, your student loans are likely to be very small, something less than $25,000. Um, if you go to that middle range college, the private not-for-profit, um, your student loans are likely to be between thirty and fifty thousand dollars, and um, if you go to the top end college, your student loans could be over a hundred thousand dollars. 
But remember this, no matter where you got your degree, everybody gets the same starting salary. So the rule is that there should be some correlation between what you pay for your college education and what you expect to earn in the career that you're going to enter. And the rule of thumb that I generally give people is you should earn in five years what you paid for your college education. And if you can't figure out that you can do that in five years, um, then you probably shouldn't do it. So if you go back to the example that I gave you of making $38,000 a year um, in five years, uh, you will make about uh, $140,000 if you went to Chicago State and paid $120,000 for that degree. You will have earned more than you paid for your degree in five years. The other two examples, you make less. So if you don't have the money to write the check for a college of any choice, get the degree that's going to allow you to enter the field, but is an affordable degree. That would be my advice. Yeah, and, and that's something I actually took with my daughter that went off to college. Now, if I would send her to college here in the Houston area, mm -hmm. um, we would have paid a whole lot of money uh, for a nursing degree because she wanted to get her uh, nursing first and she wanted to go off to medical school. Mm -hmm. Well, we sent her to a college six hours away, and it's extremely affordable, right. so much so that she don't have to come out of pocket uh, for any loans because m my goal with my daughter is this. I said, I want you to get through school with no debt. So let's make the same, you know, wise choices. Um, and that's, and I agree with that so much, you know, cause some people get caught up in a name. Oh, I'm at the university of Houston or I'm at Baylor. Or I'm at, you know, uh, Vanderbilt or whatever. But if you go, like you said, if you're going into college and getting paid uh, when you get out the same amount of money, no matter what school you went to, then like you said, what's the point of a name brand schools? Exactly. So the other thing that, um, I will tell you is, um, in the realm of loans, federal student loans are better than private student loans. Right um, idea in mind, because what you've already done is, you know, it's like if you're going to go to college, no matter what you want to do, there is a college for your pocketbook. And you just got to look to find the college for your pocket pocketbook. Um, and it's a hard thing um, because people have been so sold on these brands. but. Mm -hmm and they're telling you that it's an investment, right? You can't have both. You can't have an investment and a brand. So I'm saying make the investment and, you know, do the analysis based on the dollars. Right. Because, um, let's say my daughter, when she get done with, uh, her nursing, if she come back here, they have the university of Texas medical branch, and their residency program, you'll save more money as well versus certain, you know, other ones that say if you go to John Hopkins or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a way to do it w without breaking yourself. And, and as people, you know, we in society, unfortunately, we are sold on a lot of lies, unfortunately. Right. And the biggest thing that I take away from everything that you said was this go to school on what you can afford because when you get out of college, they're paying the same amount of money, whether you are in a community college degree or a degree from some big time school. And so I'm going to tell you a couple of other things to think about if this bothers you to buy on price. Um, you know, if you start off at a Houston community college, right? And you take a class, take English 101, when you transfer to the University of Houston, they're going to take that class and give you the full credit. And what you ought to understand by that is that it means, um, it, what it really means is that those classes are equivalent, but they don't cost the same. Right. So understanding hey. that is really important. Now, the second thing I'm going to tell you about buying on price like if you start off at a community college, nobody ever asks you where you started college. They only ask you where you finished. So if you start at a community college and spend two years getting a low priced general education, instead of taking those same gen ed classes at an expensive university, you're smart because you get to keep the pocket in, the money in your pocket. And guess what, when you finish your four year degree, you're going to have the same four-year degree 
It's not going to have a little asterisk on it saying started at community college. It's going to say this person is a graduate of the University of Houston with all of the honors that that degree confers. And that is just wonderful information. And I don't want no one to get their paychecks garnished. I don't want anyone to get sued by, you know, private uh, lenders. None of us want those consequences. So the key is, is prevention. Yes. Um, and making the right moves to make sure that we, you know, as parents, cause a lot of times we have to make these help our children make these decisions. Um, so they won't screw up because I don't want, like I said, my daughter or nobody else's children, um, in a, so much debt they can't you know look up and, and have anything um but what's another thing i want to ask you before i wrap up what's what's okay. the common mistake that people make with these loans um that you see and maybe offer misinformation the most common mistake that people make is not immediately going into repayment when they uh graduate and also not choosing an income-based repayment plan so income-based repayment plans are something that went into effect back in 2007. And what it says is you get to pay back your student loan based on what you earn and not what you borrow. So if you happen to be in you know, one of those people who gets out of college in a recession and you wind up working as a barista making $10 an hour, but you owe $40,000 in student loan debt, your payment might be as low as nothing if you sign up for the program. So don't run from it, don't hide, um, sign up as soon as you're obligated to repay and make sure that you say, I'm interested in the income driven repayment plan and that you sign up for that. So what that does is it tops out your payments at 10% of your adjustable gross income, which means that that allows you to have a life on what you earn and not spend all of your money paying off your student loans. And you only get that option with federal student loans, and that's why they're better than private. Okay, well, Miss C. Cole Dillon, thank you for today for joining us on the show, um, you know, and giving us the information that we need about uh, student loans and to make wise choices because, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately you know, it, it takes just one mistake and then you just in a world of trouble. So how can people uh, get in contact with you if they want to find out more about student loans? So um, you can reach us on our website. Our website is www.studentloan411.co, not .com, .co. Um, or you can call us nationwide. We have one number, 855-754-1111. Okay, everyone. So make sure to continue the conversation. If you want to ask more questions about student loans, because a lot of people in this country is dealing with that issue. Um, and so if you can clear up some misinformation. It'll help you make better choices. So thank you very much for joining us on the show today, Miss C. Cole Dillon, and you have a great day. Okay. Thank you so much. And you have a great day as well.